At 07.30, the main command group of the 116th began to come in, including the regimental commander, Colon Charles Cannum, and the assistant commander of the 29th Division, Brig, General Norman Cota. They were in an LCVP with an assault team from Company K. The boat got hung up on a beach obstacle to which a teller mine was attached. Although the boat rose and fell in the swells, by some miracle the mine did not go off, but the LCVP was under heavy machine gun, mortar and light cannon fire. Three men, including Madge, John Sowers, the regimental S4, were instantly killed as the ramp went down. The scene the commanders saw as they struggled their way to the beach was described by Cota's aide-de-camp Let J.T. Shi in a letter he wrote ten days later. Although the leading elements of the assault had been on the beach for approximately an hour, none had progressed farther than the seawall at the inland border of the beach. They were clustered under the wall, pinned down by machine-gun fire, and the enemy was beginning to bring effective mortar fire to bear on those hidden behind the wall. The beach was jammed with the dead, the dying, the wounded and the disorganised. When Cotter got to the wall, he made an immediate and critical command decision. He saw at once that the plan to go up the drawers was obsolete. It simply could not be done. Nor could the men stay where they were. They had to get over the shingle, get through the heavily mined swamp and climb the bluff to drive the Germans from their trenches and take the drawers from the inland side. Lieutenant Shea described Cotter's actions. Exposing himself to enemy fire, General Cotter went over the seawall giving encouragement, directions and orders to those about him, personally supervised the placing of a BR and brought fire to bear on some of the enemy, positions on the bluff that faced them. Finding a belt of barbed wire inside the seawall, General Cotter personally supervised placing a Bangalore torpedo for blowing the wire and was one of the first three men to go through the wire. Six mortar shells fell into the immediate area. They killed three men and wounded two others, but Cota was unharmed. At the head of a mixed column of troops he threaded his way to the foot of the high ground beyond the beach and started the troops up the high ground where they could bring effective fire to bear on the enemy positions. Behind him, engineers with mine detectors began marking a path through the minefield using white tape. Some of the boats in the follow-up waves got in relatively unscathed. It was a question of luck and numbers. The luck was avoiding mined obstacles, now well under water. The numbers of boats coming in meant that the Germans could no longer concentrate their fire. They had too many targets. By 0730 what was supposed to have happened with the first wave was beginning to take place. The assault teams were coming forward on every sector of the beach. Others had bad luck. LCI-92, approaching Dogwhite about 0740, was hit in the stern by an 88 as it made its first attempt to get through the obstacles. Captain Robert Walker of HQ Company was on LCI-91, just behind LCI-92. As it approached the beach, LCI-91 began taking rifle and machine gun fire. Manoeuvring through the obstacles, the LCI got caught on one of the pilings and set off the teller mine. The explosion tore off the starboard landing ramp. The skipper tried to back off. Walker moved to the port side ramp, only to find it engulfed in flames. A man carrying a flamethrower had been hit by a bullet. Another bullet had set the jellied contents of his fuel tank on fire. Screaming in agony, he dove into the sea. I could see that even the soles of his boots were on fire. Men around him also burned. Walker saw a couple of riflemen with horrendous drooping face blisters. The skipper came running to the front deck, waving his arms and yelling, Everybody over the side! Walker jumped into water about eight feet deep. He was carrying so much equipment that despite two May Wests, he could not stay afloat. He dropped his rifle, then his helmet, then his musette bag, which enabled him to swim to where he could touch bottom. Here I was on Omaha Beach. Instead of being a fierce, well-trained fighting infantry warrior, I was an exhausted, almost helpless, unarmed survivor of a shipwreck. When he got to waist-deep water, he got on his knees and crawled the rest of the way. Working his way forward to the seawall, he saw the body of Captain Zappacosta. At the seawall, 
I saw dozens of soldiers, mostly wounded. The wounds were ghastly to see. Walker came to Cota's conclusion. Any place was better than this. The plan was kaput. He couldn't go back. He set out on his own to climb the bluff. He picked up an M1 and a helmet from a dead soldier and moved out. I was alone and completely on my own. Maypaw, Sidney Bingham, was CO of 2nd Battalion, 116th. When he reached the shingle, he was without radio, aid, or runner. His S3 was dead, his HQ Company commander wounded, his E Company commander dead, his F Company commander wounded, his H Company commander killed, and in E Company there were some 55 killed out of a total of something just over 200 who landed. Bingham was overwhelmed by a feeling of complete futility. Here I was, the battalion commander, unable for the most part to influence action or do what I knew had to be done. He set out to organise a leaderless group from F Company and get it moving up the bluff. By this time, around 0745, unknown others were doing the same, whether NCOs or junior officers or, in some cases, privates. Staying on the beach meant certain death. Retreat was not possible. Someone had to lead. Men took the burden on themselves and did. Bingham put it this way. The individual and small unit initiative carried the day. Very little, if any, credit can be accorded company, battalion or regimental commanders for their tactical prowess and or their coordination of the action. Bingham did an analysis of what went wrong for the first and second waves. Among other factors, he said, the men were in the Higgins boats far too long. Seasickness occasioned by the three or four hours in LCVPs played havoc with any idealism that may have been present. It markedly decreased the combat effectiveness of the command. In addition, the individual loads carried were in my view greatly excessive, hindered mobility, and in some cases caused death by drowning. In his view, if the enemy had shown any sort of enthusiasm and moved toward us, they could have run us right back into the channel without any trouble. From June 6, 1944, on to 1990, Bingham carried with him an unjustified self-criticism. I've often felt very ashamed of the fact that I was so completely inadequate as a leader on the beach on that frightful day. That is the way a good battalion commander feels when he is leading not much more than a squad. But Bingham got that squad over the shingle and into an attack against the enemy, which was exactly the right thing to do, and the only thing he could do under the circumstances. The Germans did not counter-attack for a number of reasons, some of them good ones. First, they were not present in sufficient strength. General Kreis had but two of his infantry battalions and one artillery battalion on the scene, about 2,000 men, or less than 250 per kilometre. Second, he was slow to react. Not until 0735 did he call up his division reserve Kampfgruppe Meyer, and then he decided to commit only a singular battalion, which did not arrive until midday. He was acting on a false assumption that his men had stopped the invasion at Omaha. Third, the German infantrymen were not trained for assaults, only to hold their positions and keep firing. One German private, who was manning an MG-42 on top of the bluff, put it this way, in a 1964 radio interview. It was the first time I shoot at living men. I don't remember exactly how it was. The only thing I know is that I went to my machine gun and I shoot. The sacrifice of good men that morning was just appalling. Capt Walter Schilling of D Company, who had given a magnificent briefing to his magnificently trained men, was in the lead boat in the third wave. He was as good a company CO as there was in the US Army. The company was coming into a section of the beach that had no one on it. There was no fire. Schilling remarked to Pert George Kobe, See, I told you it was going to be easy. Moments later, before the ramp went down, Schilling was killed by a shell. Little William Gardner was the company executive officer, a West Point graduate described by Sergeant John Robert Slaughter as young, articulate, handsome, tough and aggressive. He possessed all the qualities to become a high-ranking officer in the army. The ramp went down on his boat some 150 metres from shore. 
the men got off without loss. Gardner ordered them to spread out and keep low. He was killed by machine gun fire before he made the shore. Sergeant Slaughter's boat was bracketed by German artillery fire. At 100 metres from shore, the British coxswain said he had to lower the ramp and everyone should get out quickly. Sergeant Willard Norfleet told him to keep going. These men have heavy equipment and you will take them all the way in. The coxswain begged, but we'll all be killed. Norfleet unholstered his forty-five Colt pistol, put it to the sailor's head and ordered, All the way in. The coxswain proceeded. Sergeant Slaughter, up at the front of the boat, was thinking, If this boat don't hurry up and get us in, I'm going to die from seasickness. The boat hit a sandbar and stopped. I watched the movie The Longest Day, Slaughter recalled, and they came charging off those boats and across the beach like banshees. But that isn't the way it happened. You came off the craft, you hit the water, and if you didn't get down in it, you were going to get shot. The incoming fire was horrendous. This turned the boys into men, Slaughter commented. Some would be very brave men, others would soon be dead men, but all of those who survived would be frightened men. Some wet their britches, others cried unashamedly, and many just had to find it within themselves to get the job done. In a fine tribute to Captain Schilling, Slaughter concluded, This is where the discipline and training took over. Slaughter made his way toward shore. There were dead men floating in the water, and there were live men acting dead, letting the tide take them in. Most of Company D was in the water a full hour, working forward. Once he reached shore, for Slaughter getting across the beach to the shingle became an obsession. He made it. The first thing I did was to take off my assault jacket and spread my raincoat so I could clean my rifle. It was then I saw bullet holes in my raincoat. I lit my first cigarette. I had to rest and compose myself because I became weak in my knees. Colonel Canham came by with his right arm in a sling and a forty-five Colt in his left hand. He was yelling and screaming for the officers to get the men off the beach. Get the hell off this damn beach and go kill some Germans. This was the critical moment in the battle. It was an ultimate test. Could a democracy produce young men tough enough to take charge, to lead? As poet Carl Wiest put it, it was simple fear that stopped us at that shingle, and we lay there and we got butchered by rocket fire and by mortars, for no damn reason other than the fact that there was nobody there to lead us off that goddamn beach. Like I say, hey man, I did my job, but somebody had to lead me. All across Omaha, the men who had made it to the shingle hid behind it. Then Kota, or Canham, or a captain here, a lieutenant there, a sergeant someplace else, began to lead. They would cry out, follow me, and start moving up the bluff. In Sergeant Lewis's case, Lartelio van de Voort said, let's go, goddamn, there ain't no use staying here, we're all going to get killed. The first thing he did was to run up to a gun emplacement and throw a grenade in the embrasure. He returned with five or six prisoners. So then we thought, hell, if he can do that, why can't we? That's how we got off the beach. That was how most men got off the beach. Pet Raymond Howell, an engineer attached to D Company, described his thought process. He took some shrapnel in helmet and hand. That's when I said, bullshit, if I'm going to die, to hell with it, I'm not going to die here. The next bunch of guys that go over that goddamn wall, I'm going with them, if I'm going to be infantry. So I don't know who else, I guess all of us decided, well, it is time to start. The 16th Infantry Regiment of the 1st Division Big Red One was the only first wave assault unit on D-Day with combat experience. It didn't help much. Nothing the 16th had seen in the North Africa and Sicily landings compared to what it encountered at Easy Red, Fox Green and Fox Red on June 6, 1944. Like the 116th, the 16th landed in a state of confusion, off-target, badly intermingled, under intense machine gun, rifle, mortar and artillery fire from both flanks and the front. Schedules were screwed up, paths through the obstacles were not cleared, most officers, the first men off the boats, were wounded or killed before they could take even one step on the beach. 
The naval gunfire support lifted as the Higgins boats moved in and would not resume until the smoke and haze revealed definite targets or until Navy fire control officers ashore radioed back specific coordinates. Most of the DD tanks had gone down in the channel. The few that made it were disabled. As a consequence, the German defenders were able to fire at pre-sighted targets from behind their fortifications, unimpeded by incoming fire. The American infantry struggled ashore with no support whatsoever. Casualties were extremely heavy, especially in the water and in the 200 metres or so of open beach. As with the 116th to the right, for the 16th Regiment first and second waves, D-Day was more reminiscent of an infantry charge across no man's land at the Somme in World War I than a typical World War II action. Our life expectancy was about zero, for John McPhee declared. We were burdened down with too much weight. We were just pack mules. I was very young, in excellent shape. I could walk for miles, endure a great deal of physical hardship, but I was so seasick I thought I would die. In fact, I wished I had. I was totally exhausted. Jumping off the ramp into chest-deep water, McPhee barely made it to the beach. There, I fell and for what seemed an eternity, I lay there. He was hit three times, once in the lower back, twice in the left leg. His arm was paralysed. That did it. I lost all my fear and knew I was about to die. I made peace with my maker and was just waiting. McPhee was lucky. Two of his buddies dragged him to the shelter of the seawall. Eventually, he was evacuated. He was told he had a million-dollar wound. For him, the war was over. As the ramp on his Higgins boat went down, Sergeant Clayton Hanks had a flashback. When he was five years old, he had seen a World War I photograph in a Boston newspaper. He had said to his mother, I wish I could be a war soldier someday. Don't ever say that again, his mother had replied. He didn't, but at age 17, he joined the regular army. He had been in ten years when the ramp went down, and he recalled his mother's words. I volunteered, he said to himself. I asked for this or whatever was to come. He leaped into the water and struggled forward. Pert Warren Rulian came in with the second wave. Dead soldiers floated around in the water, which had risen past the first obstacles. He ducked behind a steel rail in waist-deep water. His platoon leader, a 19-year-old lieutenant, was behind another rail. The lieutenant yelled, Hey, Rulian, here I go! and began attempting to run to the shore. A machine gun cut him down. Rulian grabbed one of the bodies floating in the water and pushed it in front of him as he made his way to the shore. I had only gone a short distance when three or four soldiers began lining up behind me. I shouted, don't bunch up, and moved out, leaving them with the body. I got as low as I could in the water until I reached a sandbar and crossed it on my belly. On the inland side of the sandbar, the water was up to his chest. He moved forward. On the shore, there were officers sitting there, stunned. Nobody was taking command. He joined other survivors at the seawall. The coxswain on Fafford Charles Thomas's boat was killed by machine gun fire as he was taking his craft in. A crew member took over. The platoon leader had his arm shot off trying to open the ramp. Finally the ramp dropped and the assault team leaped into the surf. Thomas had a Bangalore torpedo to carry, so he was last man in the team. As I was getting off I stopped to pick up a smoke grenade, as if I didn't have enough to carry. The guy running the boat yelled for me to get off. He was in a hurry, but I turned around and told him that I wasn't in any hurry. Thomas jumped into chest-deep water. My helmet fell back on my neck and the strap was choking me. My rifle sling was dragging under the water and I couldn't stand. He inflated his May West and finally made it to shore. There I crawled in over wounded and dead but I couldn't tell who was who and we had orders not to stop for anyone on the edge of the beach to keep going or we would be hit ourselves. When he reached the seawall, it was crowded with GIs all being wounded or killed. It was overcrowded with GIs. I laid on my side and opened my fly. I had to urinate. I don't know why I did that because I was soaking wet anyway, and I was under fire, and I guess I was just being neat. Thomas worked his way over to the left, where I ran into a bunch of my buddies from the company. Most of them didn't even have a riffly. 
Some bum ed cigarettes off of me because I had three cartons wrapped in waxed paper. Thomas was at the base of the bluff. In his opinion, the Germans could have swept us away with brooms if they knew how few we were and what condition we were in. Capt. Fred Hall was in the LCVP carrying the 2nd Battalion Headquarters Group. Hall was Battalion S3. His heart sank when he saw yellow life rafts holding men in life jackets, and he realised they were the crews from the DD tanks. He realised that meant that we would not have tank support on the beach. The boat was in the E Company sector of Easy Red. E Company was supposed to be on the far right of the 16th, linking up with the 116th at the boundary between Easy Green and Easy Red, but it came in near the boundary between Easy Red and Fox Green, a full kilometre from the nearest 116th unit on its right, and with sections of the badly mislanded E Company of the 116th on its left. There was nothing to be done about the mistake. The officers and men jumped into the water, and it was every man for himself crossing the open beach where we were under fire. Fourteen of the thirty failed to make it. Hall got up to the seawall with Hicks, and we opened our map case wrapped in canvas, containing our assault maps showing unit boundaries, phase lines, and objectives. I remember it seemed a bit incongruous under the circumstances. The incoming fire was murderous. And the noise, always the noise, naval gunfire, small arms, artillery and mortar fire, aircraft overhead, engine noises, the shouting and the cries of the wounded. No wonder some people couldn't handle it. The assistant regimental commander and the forward artillery observer were killed by rifle fire. Lieutenant Colonel Hicks shouted to Hall to find the company commanders. To Hall, it was a matter of survival. I was so busy trying to round up the COs to organise their men to move off the beach that there wasn't much time to think except to do what had to be done. Hicks wanted to move his men to the right, where the battalion was supposed to be, opposite the draw that led up the bluff between Saint-Laurent and Colville. But movement was almost impossible. The tide was coming in rapidly, follow-up waves were landing, the beach was narrowing from the incoming tide. It became very crowded and the confusion increased. So far as Hall could make out, there was no movement off the beach. In fact, one platoon from E Company, 16th Regiment, was making its way up to the top of the bluff. It was led by Lord John Spaulding of E Company. He was one of the first junior officers to make it across the seawall, through the swamp and beach flat, and up the bluff. At early 6.30, Spaulding's boat hit a sandbar. He and Sergeant Fred Biscoe kicked the ramp down in the face of machine gun, mortar and artillery fire. Spaulding jumped into the water. To his left he could see other E Company boats, but to his right there was nothing. His platoon was the far right flank of the 16th Regiment. He spread his men and moved toward shore. The water depth at the sandbar was about a metre, but moving inland the platoon ran into a rundle where the water was over the men's heads. A strong undercurrent was carrying them to the left. Sergeant Stretzik and Medic George Bowen were carrying an 18-foot ladder to be used for crossing the anti-tank ditch. Spaulding grabbed it. Stretzik yelled at me, Lieutenant, we don't need any help, but hell I was trying to get help, not to give it. In these desperate circumstances, Spaulding ordered his men to abandon their heavy equipment and get ashore. There went the ladder, the flamethrower, the mortars, one of the two bazookas and some of the ammunition. Most men were able to hold on to their rifles. To Spaulding's surprise, they were able to fire as soon as they came ashore. It shows that the M1 is an excellent weapon, he commented. The platoon took only a couple of casualties getting ashore. Luck was with Spaulding. He had come in at a spot where the German defences were not particularly heavy and besides the Germans had bigger targets than an isolated platoon. Once the men reached the beach, they stood up and started moving across the sand. They were too waterlogged to run, Spaulding said, but they went as fast as they could. It looked as if they were walking in the face of a real strong wind. At the seawall, Sergeant Curtis Colwell blew a hole in the wire with a bangalore. Spaulding and his men picked their way through. Spaulding took his 536 radio off his shoulder, pulled the antenna out, and tried to contact his CO. 
The radio didn't work. The mouthpiece had been shot away. I should have thrown it away, but training habits were so strong that I carefully took the antenna down as I had always been taught to do and put the 536 back on my shoulder. Your training stays with you even when you are scared. Once across the seawall, the platoon began to take heavier small arms fire. One man was killed. The swamp and beach flat to the front were mined. Sergeant Stretic and Pitt Richard Gallagher went forward to investigate. We can't cross here, they shouted, and went to the left where they found a little defilade through the mined area. The platoon crossed to the base of the bluff, then began to climb it, following a faint trail. We could still see no one to the right, and there was no one up to us on the left, Spalding said. We didn't know what had become of the rest of E Company. Back in the water boats were in flames. I saw a tank ashore, knocked out. After a couple of looks back, we decided we wouldn't look back any more. There was a pillbox to Spalding's left, its machine gun firing down on the beach. We fired but couldn't hit them. We were getting terrific small arms fire ourselves, but few were hit. By this time, the platoon was about halfway up the bluff, smack in the middle of the extensive German trench system. Puff to Gallagher, in the lead, sent word that he had found a path toward the right that was in defilade, behind some trenches in a mined area. Spalding moved forward. Sergeant Bisco called out, Lieutenant, watch out for the damn mines. The place was infested with them, Spalding recalled, but we lost no men coming through them, although H Company coming along the same trail a few hours later lost several men. The Lord was with us and we had an angel on each shoulder on that trip. A machine gun was firing from above. Sergeant Blades fired the platoon's only bazooka at it and missed. He was shot in the left arm. A private was shot down. Sergeant Phelps moved up with his bar and was hit in both legs. Spalding decided to rush the machine gun. As we rushed it, the lone German operating the gun threw up his hands and yelled, Kamerad! We needed prisoners for interrogating, so I ordered the men not to shoot. The German turned out to be Polish. He told Spalding there were 16 other Poles in the nearby trenches and said they had taken a vote on whether to fight and had voted not to, but the German non-coms forced them to fire. He also said that he had not shot at us, although I had seen him hit three. I turned the PW over to Sergeant Blades, who was wounded. Blades gave his bazooka to another man and guarded the prisoner with a trench knife. Spalding moved his wounded men into a defile where piffed George Bowen, the medic, gave them first aid. Spalding paid Bowen a tribute. He covered his whole section of the beach that day. No man waited more than five minutes for first aid. His action did a lot to help morale. He got the DSC for his work. Spalding moved his platoon up the bluff, taking advantage of every irregularity in the ground. Coming up along the crest of the hill, Sergeant Clarence Colson began to give assault fire from his bar as he walked along, firing the weapon from his hip. He opened up on the machine gun to our right, firing so rapidly that his ammunition carrier had difficulty getting ammo to him fast enough. It was about eight sail sounds. Americans were clearing out the trenches and advancing toward the high ground. Spalding and his men and other small units in the 116th and 16th, led by such men as Captain Joe Dawson and Captain Robert Walker, were doing a great thing. The exemplary manner in which they had seized their opportunity, their dash, boldness, initiative, teamwork and tactical skills were outstanding beyond praise. These were exactly the qualities the army had hoped for and spent two years training its civilians turned soldiers to achieve in its junior officers, NCOs and enlisted men. The industrial miracle of production in the United States in World War II was one of the great accomplishments in the history of the Republic. The job the army did in creating and shaping the leadership qualities in its junior officers, just college-age boys most of them, was also one of the great accomplishments in the history of the Republic. At eight or the small groups making their way up the bluff were unaware of each other. Spalding and his men were about midway between Colleville and Saint-Laurent. The latter village was their target. 
There they expected to link up with E Company, 116th, coming in from their right. Actually, E Company, 116th, had been on their left on the beach and was still stuck behind the seawall. L Company of the 16th was on the far left. It came in at 07 Tozaira, a half hour late, almost a kilometre from its target. Scheduled to land at the foot of the draw that led directly to Collerville, instead it was at Fox Green, the eastern edge of Omaha Beach, at the place where the tidal flat almost reached the bluff, and where the first rise of the bluff was cliff-like in steepness. Because the boats were late, the tide had covered the outermost line of beach obstacles. No company had been scheduled to land on Fox Red, so no engineers had been there to blow the obstacles. But Kenneth Romansky saw the boat to his right blow up. He looked left, and that boat also hit a mine. He saw a GI go up about ten feet in the air, arms and legs outstretched and his whole body in flame. About that time, our platoon leader, Lieutenant Godwin, said, Back it up, back it up, put the damn thing in reverse. The British coxswain did. He pulled back about 100 metres and went over to the left. Drop the ramp, Lieutenant Godwin ordered. Drop the ramp. The water was eight feet deep. Romansky moved out and immediately hit bottom. He threw away his rifle and Bangalore, inflated his May West, and swam toward shore or rather paddled as best he could until his feet touched bottom. Then he crawled to the beach, jumped up and ran the few metres to the base of the cliff. There were already men there, some dead, some wounded. There was wreckage. There was complete confusion. I didn't know what to do. I picked a rifle from a dead man. As luck would have it, it had a grenade launcher on it, so I fired my six grenades over the cliff. I don't know where they went, but I do know that they went up on enemy territory. Romansky looked back to the beach and saw a sight. I'll never forget. There was a body rolling with the waves, and his leg was holding on by a chunk of meat about the size of your wrist. The body would roll, then the leg would roll, then the leg would roll back, and then the body would roll back. To L Company's right, there was a tiny draw leading up the far eastern edge of the bluff. An unknown officer was attempting to get the men to move to the right and up the draw. I need help, Romansky heard him shout. I need help. Come on over here. I need some men. Romansky moved in that direction. The company was down to 125 men, but it was intact and better organised than any other on the whole of Omaha Beach. Romansky joined the unknown officer, who had gathered 20 men. They started up the draw other platoons following, between Spalding's platoon on the right and L Company on the left. Companies E, F and I were badly intermixed, off schedule and off target, hung up on the obstacles or the beach or huddled up against the seawall, taking casualties but not firing back. Perft H. W. Schroeder was among them. He came in with the third wave. As his boat approached the sandbar, we were hearing noises on the side of the landing craft, like someone throwing gravel against it. The German machine gunners had picked us up. Everybody yelled, Stay down! The coxswain backed it out, relocated, and came in again, and I noticed the lieutenant's face was a very grey colour, and the rest of the men had a look of fear on their faces. All of a sudden, the lieutenant yelled to the coxswain, Let her down! The ramp dropped, and we could get a look at the beach, and it was sickening. We were supposed to have tanks. There were two tanks there. One was knocked out and the other was out of ammo, and the only good they were doing was the GIs were piling up behind them to get out of the fire that was coming down and looked like a red snowstorm. There were so many tracers coming from so many different directions. Schroeder moved out with his assault team, got through the obstacles and across the beach, and threw himself down at the seawall. There were GIs piled too deep. I started checking my 30 cal machine gun and it was full of sand and water. He cleaned it and stayed there for an hour or so. The coxswain on the boat carrying the CO of I Company, Captain Kimball Richmond, got swept to the east almost to port on bessin He was going to land there, but Richmond could see it was the wrong place. He redirected the coxswain, who backtracked to the west until he was off Fox Green, the designated target. An hour had been lost. 
When the coxswain finally got to the right place and dropped the ramp, he was immediately hit by machine gun fire. He was still able to manoeuvre the boat. He ordered the ramp pulled up, then backed off out of the range of the machine gun. He circled until Captain Richmond picked a spot and told him to go in. It was about eighty ones and the tide had covered the outer obstacles. Going in, the coxswain hardly knew which to fear more, mines or machine guns. About one hundred metres from shore, as Pert Albert Momine remembered it, the craft gave a sudden lurch as it hit an obstacle, and in an instant an explosion erupted followed by a blinding flash of fire. Flames raced around and over us. The first reaction was survival. The immediate instinct was the will to live. Before I knew it, I was in the water. Momonet was five feet one inch tall and in water well over his head. He dropped his rifle and equipment, inflated his May West, and swam toward shore, machine gun bullets hitting around him, killing some GIs, wounding others. About fifty yards from shore, the water was shallow enough for me to wade. Thirty yards to go, and then twenty. I was exhausted and in shock. I heard a voice shouting, Come on, little one, come on, you can make it. It was Lieutenant Anderson, the exec, urging me on. It seemed like someone had awakened me from a dream. I lunged toward him, and as I reached him, he grabbed my hand and pulled me out of the water, then practically dragged me to the cover of the seawall. Only six out of thirty in my craft escaped unharmed. Looking around, all I could see was a scene of havoc and destruction, abandoned vehicles and tanks, equipment strung all over the beach, medics attending the wounded, chaplains seeking the dead. Suddenly I had a craving for a cigarette. Has anybody got a smoke? I asked. My company had taken more than one-third casualties. F Company, landing earlier at Fox Green, was simply gone as a fighting unit. Some individuals had made it to the shingle, but they were mostly without weapons. G Company came in at 07 Zazera. The CO, Captain Joe Dawson, was first off his boat, followed by his communications sergeant and his company clerk. As they jumped, a shell hit the boat and destroyed it, killing 30 men, including the naval officer who was to control fire support from the warships. Dawson expected to find a path up the bluff cleared out by F Company, but, as I landed, I found nothing but men and bodies lying on the shore. He got to the shingle where survivors from other boats of G Company joined him. Among them was Sergeant Joe Pilk. He recalled, We couldn't move forward because they had a double apron of barbed wire in front of us, and to our right it was a swampy area we couldn't cross, and to the left they had minefields laid out so we couldn't go there. Utter chaos reigned, Dawson recalled, because the Germans controlled the field of fire completely. He realised that there was nothing I could do on the beach except die. To get through the barbed wire, he had Pytes. Ed Tatara and Henry Peschek put two Bangalore torpedoes together, shoved them under the wire and blew a gap. They started through the minefield and up the bluff, engaging the enemy. The fortified area above the beach in the Easy and Fox sectors was far too extensive to be thoroughly cleaned out by Spalding's and Dawson's small units, but they, and other units, were making a significant contribution to reducing the volume of fire pouring down on the 16th Regiment. Spalding's and Dawson's and the other small groups that were working their way to the top were like magnets to the men along the shingle embankment. If they can make it so can I, was the thought. Simultaneously, the men were being urged forward by other junior officers and NCOs and by the regimental commander, 47-year-old Collis George Taylor. He landed about eight so sour. Pat, Warren Rulian watched him come in. He stepped across the sandbar and bullets began hitting the water around him. He laid down on his stomach and started crawling toward shore, his staff officers doing the same. He had a couple of tattered-ass second Louis following him, according to Pert Paul Radsom, who was also watching. They looked like they were scared to death. When Taylor made it to the seawall, Rulian heard him say to the officers, If we're going to die, let's die up there. To other groups of men, Taylor said, There are only two kinds of people on this beach, the dead and those about to die. So let's get the hell out of here.
Men got to work with the Bangalores, blowing gaps in the barbed wire. Engineers with mine detectors moved through, then started laying out tape to show where they had cleared paths through the minefields. Others hit the pillboxes at the base of the bluff. I went up with my flamethrower to button up the aperture of a pillbox, Fotbuddy Mazara of C Company remembered, and Fred Urban came in with his dynamite charge. Soon some soldiers came out of the pillbox with their hands up saying, No shoot, no shoot, me pole. Private Schruder, his machine gun cleaned and ready to fire, watched as a rifleman moved out. So the first man he started out across, and running zigzag he made it to the bluff, so we all felt a little better to see that we had a chance, we were going to get off, and the minefield was already full of dead and wounded, and finally it came my turn, and I grabbed my heavy thirty cal and started up over the shingle and across the minefield, trying to keep low. Finally I got to the base of the bluff. There I ducked behind the old foundation of a house. Two others joined me. It was just the three of us there. We couldn't find our platoon leaders or our platoon sergeants or anybody. But we could see two heartening sights. One was Americans on the crest of the bluff. The other was a line of POWs, sent down by Captain Dawson under guard. The enemy prisoners were really roughed up. Their hair was all full of cement, dirt, everything. They didn't look so tough. So we started up the bluff carrying our stuff with us, and others started following us.